Chapter 1 The Bat Hey Tom, where were you last night? Yeah, you missed it. Ellen and Billy came up the front walk. Tom was sitting on his porch steps, bouncing the tennis ball. Old man Tater cut Joe as we were climbing through the fence, so we all had to go back, and he made us pile the peaches on his kitchen table, and then he called our mothers. Joe's mother hasn't let him out yet. Where were you? Tom stopped bouncing the tennis ball. He was a tall, skinny boy who took his troubles very seriously. My mother kept me in. What for? I wouldn't eat my dinner. Alan sat down on the step below Tom and began to chew his thumbnail. What was it? Salmon casserole. Billy flopped down on the grass, chunky, snub nose, freckled. Salmon casserole's not so bad. Wouldn't she let you just eat two bites? asked Alan. Sometimes my mother says, well, all right, if I'll just eat two bites, I wouldn't eat even one. That's stupid, said Billy. One bite can't hurt you. I'd eat one bite of anything before I'd let them send me up to my room right after supper. Tom shrugged. How about mud? Ellen asked Billy. You wouldn't eat a bite of mud. Ellen argued a lot, small, knobby neat, nervous, gnawing at his thumbnail, his face smudged. His red hair must, shirt tail hanging out, shoelaces untied. Sure I would, Billy said. Mud, what's mud? Just dirt with a little water in it. My father says everyone eats a pound of dirt every year anyway. How about poison? That's different, Billy rolled over on his back. Is your mother going to make you eat the leftovers today at lunch? He asked Tom. She never has before. How about worms? Ellen asked Billy. Tom's sister's cat squirmed out from under the porch and rubbed against Billy's knee. Sure, said Billy. Why not? Worms are just dirt. Yeah, but they bleed. So you'd have to cook them. Cows bleed. I bet a hundred dollars you wouldn't really eat a worm. You'd talk big now, but you wouldn't if you were sitting at the dinner table with a worm on your plate. I bet I would. I'd eat 50 worms if somebody spent me a hundred dollars. You really want to bet? I'll bet you fifty dollars if you can't eat 50 worms. I really will. Where are you going to get fifty dollars? In my savings account. I've got one hundred and thirty dollars and seventy-nine cents in my savings account. I know because last week I put in the five dollars my grandmother gave me for my birthday. Your mother wouldn't let you take it out. Should if I lost the bat, she'd have to. I'd tell her I was going to sell my stamp collection otherwise, and I bought that with all my own money that I earned mowing lawns so I can do whatever I want with it. I'll bet you fifty dollars you can't eat fifteen worms. Come on, you're chicken. You know you can't do it. I wouldn't do it, said Tom. If someone casserole makes me sick, Think what 15 worms would do. Joe came scuffing up the walk and flopped down beside Billy. He was a small boy with dark hair and a long nose and big brown eyes. What's going on? Come on, said Alan to Billy. Tom can be your second and Joe will be mine, just like a duel. You think it's so easy? Here's your chance to make 50 bucks. Billy dangled the leaf in front of the cat, but the cat just rubbed against his knee. Purring. What kind of worms? Regular worms. Not those big green ones that get on the tomatoes. I want eat those, and I want eat them all at once. It might make me sick. One worm a day for 15 days, and he can eat them any way he wants, said Tom. Boiled, stewed, fried, fricasseed. Yeah, but we provide the worms, said Joe. And there have to be witnesses present when he eats them, either me or Alan or somebody we can trust, not just you and Billy. Okay? Alan said to Billy. Billy scratched the cat's ears. Fifty dollars. That was a lot of money. How bad could a worm taste? He'd eat a fried liver, salmon loaf, mushrooms, tongue, pig's feet. Other kids' parents were always nagging them to eat, eat. He's had begun to worry about how much he ate. Not that he was fat. He just hadn't worked off all his winter blubber yet. 
he slid his hand into his shirt and fervently squeezed the side of his stomach. Worms were just dirt. Dirt wasn't fattening. If he won fifty dollars, he could buy that mini bike George Cunningham's brother had promised to sell him in September, before he went away to college. Heck, he could get anything down for fifty dollars, couldn't he? He looked up. I can use ketchup or mustard or anything like that as much as I want. Ellen nodded. Okay. Billy stood up. Okay. Chapter two, digging. No, said Tom. That's not fair. He and Alan and Joe were wandering around behind the barns and Billy's house, arguing over where to dig the first worm. What do you mean it's not fair? said Joe. Nobody said anything about where the worms were supposed to come from. We can get them anywhere we want. Not from a manual pile, said Tom. That's not fair. Even if we didn't make a roar about something, you still have to be fair. What difference does it make where the worm comes from? said Alan. A worm's worm. There's nothing wrong with the manure, said Joe. It comes from cows, just like milk. Joe was sly, devious, a skimmer. The manure pile had been his idea. You and Billy have got to be fair too, said Alan to Tom. Besides, we'll dig in the old part of the pile where it doesn't smell much anymore. Come on, said Tom. Starting off across the field, dragging his shovel. If it was fair, you wouldn't be so anxious about it. Would you eat a worm from a manure pile? Joe and Alan ran to catch up. I wouldn't eat a worm. Period," said Joe. "So you can't go buy that. Yeah, but if your mother told you to go out and pick some daisies for the supper table, would you pick the daisies off a manure pile? My mother wouldn't ask me. She'd ask my sister." You know what I mean. Ellen and Tom and Joe leaned on their shovels under a tree in the apple orchard, watching the worms they had dug squirming on a flat rock. Not him," said Tom, pointing to a night crawler. "Why not? Look at him. He's a chocolate dog." "Geez," exploded Ellen. "You expect us to pick one Billy can just to gulp down, like an ant or a need, gulping not." Eating," said Joe. "The worm's got to be big enough to Billy has to cut it into bites and eat it with a fork off a plate. It's this one or nothing," said Alan, picking up the night crawler. Tom considered the matter. It would be more fun watching Billy trying to eat the night crawler. He grinned. Boy, it was huge—a regular python. Wait till Billy saw it. We let's choose where to dig," said Alan. After all, thought Tom, Billy couldn't expect to win fifty dollars by just curbing down a few measly little baby worms. All right, come on. He turned and started back toward the barns, dragging his shovel. Chapter three, training camp, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Billy was doing push-ups in the deserted horse barn. He wasn't worried about eating the first worm. But people were always daring him to do things, and he'd found it was better to look ahead, to try to figure things out, get himself ready. Last winter, Alan had dared him to sleep out all night in the igloo they'd built in Tom's backyard. Why not? Billy had thought to himself, "What could happen?" About midnight, huddled, shivering under his blankets in the darkness, he'd begun to wonder if he should give up and go home. His feet felt like aching stones in his boots. Even his tongue inside his mouth was cold. But half an hour later, as he was stubbornly dancing about outside in the moonlight to warm himself, Tom's dog Martha had come along with the six other dogs, all in a pack, and Billy had coaxed them into the igloo and blocked the door with an orange crate. And after the dogs had stopped wrestling and nipping and barking and sniffing around. They'd all gone to sleep in a heap with Billy in the middle, as warm as an onion in a stew. But he hadn't been able to think of anything special to do to prepare himself for eating a worm, so he was just limbering up in general: push-ups, knee bends, jumping jacks, red-faced, perspiring. Nearby, on an orange crate, he'd set out bottles of ketchup, and Worcestershire sauce, jars of pickled lily, and mustard. 
a box of crackers, certain pepper shakers, a lemon, a slice of cheese, his mother's tin cinnamon and sugar shaker, a box of Kleenex, a jar of maraschino cherries, some horseradish, and plastic honey bear. Tom's head appeared around the door. Ready? Billy scrambled up, brushing back his hair. Yeah. Ta-da! Tom flung the door open, Alan marched in, carrying a cover of the silver platter in both hands. Joe slouching along beside him with a napkin over one arm, nodding and smiling obsequiously. Tom dragged another orange crate over beside the first. Alan set the silver platter on it. A chair, cried Alan. A chair for the monsieur. Come on, said Billy. Cut the clowning. Tom found an old milking stool in one of the horse stalls. Joe dusted off with his napkin, showing his teeth, and then ushered Billy onto it. Ladies and gentlemen, shouted Alan, I present my masterpiece, Verm Lamad. He swept the cover off the platter. Ah, cried Billy, recoiling. Chapter 4 the first worm. The huge night crawler sprawled limply in the center of the platter, brown and steaming. Boiled, said Tom. We boiled it. Billy stormed about the worm, kicking barrels and pots, arguing a night crawler isn't a worm. If it was a worm, it'd be called a worm. A night crawler's night crawler. Finally, Joe ran off to get his father's dictionary. Night crawler, noun, earthworm especially a large earthworm, found on the soil surface at night. Billy kicked the barrel. It still wasn't fair. He didn't care what any dictionary said. Everybody knew the difference between a nightcrawler and a worm. Look at the thing. Yark! It was as big as a souvenir pencil from the Empire State Building. Yeah, he poked it with his finger. Alan said they'd agreed right at the start that he and Joe could choose the worms. If Billy was going to cheat... The bat was off. He got up and started for the door. He guessed he had other things to besides argue all day with a fink. So Tom took Billy aside into a horse stall and put his arm around Billy's shoulder and talked to him about George Cunningham's brother's minibike and how they could ride it on the trail under the power lines behind Otto's farm, up and down the hills, bounding over rocks. Rum, rum. Sure, it was a big worm. But it'd be only be a couple more bites. Did he want to lose a mini bike over two bites? Slop enough mustard and ketchup and horseradish on it, and he wouldn't even taste it. Yeah, said Billy. I could probably eat this one, but I got to eat fifteen. You can't quit now, said Tom. Look at them. He nodded at Alan and Joe, waiting beside the orange crates. They will tell everybody you are chicken. It'll be all over school. Come on. He led Billy back to the orange crates, set him down, tied a napkin around his neck. Alan flourished the knife and fork. Would Monsieur like it carved lengthwise or crosswise? Ketchup, asked Joe, showing his teeth. Cut it out, said Tom. Here, he gulped ketchup and mustard and horseradish on the nightcrawler, squeezed on a few drops of lemon juice and salted and peppered it. Billy closed his eyes and opened his mouth. Oh, would it? Tom slid off the end of the night crawler and forked it up. But just as he was about to poke it into Billy's open mouth, Billy closed his mouth and opened his eyes. No, let me do it. Tom handed him the fork. Billy gazed at the dripping ketchup and mustard, thinking, Ah, it's all right, talking about eating worms, but doing it? Tom whispered in his ear, Mini bike. Glug. Billy poked the fork into his mouth, chewed furiously, gurped, gurped, his eyes crossed, swam, squinched shut. He flapped his arms widely, and then opening his eyes, he grinned beautifully up at Tom. Superb, Gaston. Tom cut another piece ketchup, mustarded, salted, peppered, horseradish, and lemoned it, and handed the fork to Billy. Billy slugged it down, smacking his lips, and so they proceeded. Now, sprinkling on cinnamon and sugar, or a bit of cheese, some cracker crumbs, or Worcestershire sauce, until there was nothing on the plate but a few stray dabs of ketchup and mustard. 
fell," said Billy, standing up and wiping his mouth with his napkin. "So where the meat the first curse? Now seconds? Let me look in your mouth," said Alan. "Yeah," said Joe. "See if he swallowed all." "Sointly, sointly," said Billy. "Look as long as you can." Alan and Joe scrutinized the inside of his mouth. "Okay, okay," said Tom. "Leave him alone now. Come on." One down, fourteen to go. How'd it taste? Asked Alan. Good, good," said Billy. "We're fine, we're fine." Hoo hoo! He flapped his arms like a big bird and began to hop around the barn, crying, "Good, good, we're fine, we're fine, good, good." Alan and Joe and Tom looked worried. "Oh yeah, good, good. How you feeling, Billy?" Tom asked. "Yeah, stop flapping around and come tell us how you're feeling," said Joe. They huddled together by the orange crates as Billy hopped around and ho- around them, flapping his arms. "Good, good, we're fine, we're fine, hoo hoo," Alan whispered. "He's crackers." Joe edged toward the door. "Don't let him see. We're afraid. Crazy people are like dogs. If they see you're afraid, they will attack." "It couldn't be," whispered Tom, standing his ground. "One worm." "Good, good," screeched. Billy, hopping higher and higher and drooling from the mouth, "Come on!" whispered Joe to Tom. "Hey, Billy!" burst out Tom suddenly in a hearty, quivering voice. "Cut it out, will you? I want to ask you something." Billy's arms flapped slower. He tiptoed menacingly around Tom. His head cocked on one side, his cheeks puffed out. Tom hugged himself, chuckling nervously. Ha ha! Cut it out, will you, Billy? Ha ha! Billy pounced. Joe and Alan fled. The barn door banging behind them. Billy rolled on the floor, help, helpless with laughter. Tom clambered up, brushing himself off. Did you see their faces? Billy said, laughing, climbing over each other out the door. Oh, jeez! Joe was pale as an onion. Yeah, said Tom. Ha ha! You fooled them. Ho,、oh, jeez," Billy sat up. Then he crawled over to the door and peered out through a knothole. Look at them peeking up over the stone wall. Watch this. The door swung slowly open, screeching. Billy hopped onto the door sill, into the yard, up onto a stump, splashed into a puddle, flapping his arms, rolling his head. Alan and Joe galloped up the hill through the high grass, yelling, "Here he comes! Get out of the way!" And then Billy stopped hopping and climbing up on the stump, called in a shrill, girlish voice, "Oh, boys, where are you going? It is something there, you little boys!" Alan and Joe stopped and looked back. "It is going home, little boys!" yelled Billy. "It is old." "Who's scared, you lunk?" called Alan. "Yeah," yelled Joe. "I guess I can go home without being called scared if I want to." But ain't you a doffle hurry? Shouted Billy. I just remembered I was supposed to help my mother wash windows this afternoon, said Alan. That's all. He turned and started up through the meadow, his hands in his pockets. Yes, said Joe. Me too. He trudged after Alan. Chapter Five: The Gathering Storm. Alan and Joe stopped in the orchard by the pile of fresh dirt. You think he'll be able to do it? Asked Alan, biting his thumbnail. I don't know," said Joe. "He can't do it," said Alan. "How could anybody eat fifteen worms? My father'll kill me. Fifty dollars. He ate them one awful easy. Forget it," said Joe. "If he doesn't give up himself, I'll figure something out. We could spike the next worm with a pepper. He'd eat one piece and then another." Talking to Tom, then all of a sudden he'd sneeze. Kachum. Then he'd sneeze again, kachum. Then again, kachum, kachum. A faint look of panic would creep over his face. He's beginning to wonder if he'll ever stop. He clutches his stomach. His eyes begin to water. Kachum, kachum. Billy's awful stubborn," said Alan. Even if he, it was killing him, he might not give up. Kachum, kachum," cried Joe. He first to the floor. I bend over him. God, I say. Called his mother, as the truck lorry crosses, his eyes split up at me. Kachum, remember that business last summer? 
said Alan, gnawing on his thumbnail. When it was 95 degrees in the shade, I dared him to put on all his winter clothes and his father's raccoon coat and his ski boots and walk up and down Main Street all afternoon. Kachum, kachum. They went off through the orchard. Joe sneezing, sighing, rolling his eyes, pretending to be Billy, suffering from a dose of peppered worm. Alan moaning to himself about how stubborn Billy could be. Fifty dollars? Chapter 6 The Second Worm Billy sighed. On the plate before him lay the last bite of worm under a top of ketchup and mustard. What's the matter? asked Tom. I don't know, sighed Billy. He picked up the fork again. Does it taste bad? No, said Billy wearily. I just taste ketchup and mustard mostly, but it makes me feel sort of sick, even before I eat it, just thinking about it. He sighed again and then glanced at Joe and Alan, talking to each other in whispers over by the window. What are you whispering about? Nothing. Then what are you whispering for? Nothing. It's not important. Just something Joe's father told him last night. What? Come on, finish up. It was nothing. We'll miss the cartoons. Billy shut his eyes and popped the last piece of worm into his mouth. Chewed, gagged, clapped his hands over his mouth. Gurped, gurped. Tumbled backward off the orange crate, sprawling on his back in the chaff. He gazed peacefully up at the ceiling. Joe and Alice stood over him. Open up! Billy opened his mouth. Wider, see any Joe? Now he swallowed it. Okay, let's go. Chapter 7 Red Crash Helmets and White Jumpsuits After the movies, Tom walked on with Billy. Tomorrow I'll roll the crawler in cornmeal and fry it like a trot. It's not really the taste, said Billy. It's more the thought. When I start to eat it, even though it's smothered in ketchup and mustard and grated cheese, I can't stop thinking warm, 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 warm. Gaggles of worms in bait boxes, drowned worms drying up on sidewalks, a worm squirming as the fish you could course into him, the soggy end of a worm draggling out of a dead fish's mouth, Robin's yanking worms out of a lawn. I can't stop thinking worm. Yeah, but if I fry it in cornmeal, it won't look like a crawler, said Tom. I'll put parsley around it and some slices of lemon. And then you can concentrate and think fish. All the time you're waiting in the barn, all the time you're eating it. Keep saying to yourself, fish, 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 fish. Here I am, eating fish, good fish. Trout, salmon, flounder, perch. I'll ride my midi bike into church. Days tuna had a trout. When you will hear the minister shout. Fish, 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 fish. Shark had dog soccer eel. I'll race my father in his automobile. Eel flounder, bluegill shark. We'll race all day till after dark. Billy cheered up. Think how they'd always there. I'd wrap up the aisle, zip around the front pews, down a side aisle under the stained glass windows. My parents would kill me. Reverend Yard would peer down over the Bible stand. William, he'd cry, William, you take that engine thing out of here this minute. Yeah, and then they'd come chasing out after us, said Tom. Billy laughed, waving their arms and yelling, and we'd lead them zigzag round and round and in and out among the gravestones and monuments in the cemetery, and then roar off down the Sandgate Road, leaving them draped over Tom's, panting and shaking their fists. Hop, hop, yelled Tom, dancing around and boxing the air. And that Monday we'd smuggle it into class disguise as Raymond Dwelly because he's so fat and hide it in the coat closet. And then when Millie Butler said anything, anything at all, even something like excuse me, or if she even sniffed, we'd dump a whole bottle of ink over her head and run for the coat closet, overturning chairs and desks behind us to slow up. Mrs. Howard. She had come after us, fuming and shouting threats, and suddenly the doors of the cot closet would slam open and out. We'd roll on our mini bike in blood red crash helmets and white jumpsuits, our scarves streaming out behind us. 
and with a roll round and round the classroom, while Mrs. Howard knelt among the overturned desks and chairs, sobbing helplessly into her hands, and then rum rum out the door and up the hall, thumbing our noses at the monitors. Brackety, brackety, brackety up the stairs, stiff arming tacklers into Mr. Simmons' office, up onto his desk, broom, broom, a backfire into his face and zoom out the window as he topples backward in his chair in a hurricane of quiz papers and rapper cards. And then crunched landing on the driveway, we roll off down the highway to Bennington and join the Navy so Mrs. Howard and Mr. Simmons and our parents can't punish us.